the talk uh, today uh, it uh, uh, deals with the atom, and uh, you will soon understand uh, uh, why. Actually, I can already anticipate. We are already almost one century after the Bohr model, as you said, as you know. And the Bohr model uh, was uh, uh, was published in 1913, and therefore we thought that it would have been nice uh, uh, to spend this uh, this evening. Uh, uh, just sort of uh, going back to the root uh, of our activity. Uh, as you see uh, this talk, uh, there is another name of a person that uh, worked with me on this talk. It's, uh, her name is Alessandra Viola, and uh, she's, uh, she's a journalist, actually. And you will understand at the end uh, which is the relationship that uh, uh, was connected to this talk with her. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. I can see you're going to be rather feisty today. I am known for my inspiring rhetoric. <sighs> Blackity blue! <laughs> A simple hello would do. Thank you very much. Why, why, why do we start with Winnie the Pooh? Indeed, uh, this is a strange way probably to, to, to start a talk. And uh, uh, the reason, if I can now try to stop it, okay. Uh, the reason is that no, uh, Winnie the Pooh, uh, it's linked uh, uh, rather tightly with one of the physicists that uh, really it's uh, uh, one of the founder, I would say, of the atomic and nuclear physics, which is Enrico Fermi. Nobel Prize for Physics, 1938. Uh, and indeed, the link is the following. You know, uh, Fermi came to United States in 1938. He's, he was Italian. And uh, he wanted to improve his English, of course, uh, in the perspective of working for many years uh, at, uh, in the United States. And he used, uh, as, a, as a textbook, uh, the Winnie the Pooh book that was published in 1926. Uh, it's originally, it was a book, and then all the movie came. And uh, uh, Fermi was uh, so attached to, to this book that he used it also to name the instruments uh, that, uh, and the tools that he used in the Chicago Pile experiment, you know, in the, in the experiment that first demonstrated the, um, uh, the chain reaction, in uh, the fission chain reaction. Uh, and this, you know, there, there is a, it's interesting, if you Google this, you will see that there, there is a lot of uh, um, entries on that. And actually, rather recently, about 10 years ago, a colleague published a paper on uh, Physics Today trying to go to the root of this story because people were, uh, were telling that this was the case, but there were no direct witnesses of that. And indeed, they discovered in the archives, this is a notebook at, uh, by, by Fermi, original one, and uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, there are layer of graphites. You know, the pile was made by layers of graphite on the first column, and then the second and third column, some sand candle readings, and the readings of the instrument, which is called ROS, which is uh, that one, uh, in uh, one of the uh, one of the character of the Winnie the Pooh. And indeed, uh, this was so uh, so well established that. Uh, uh, not only himself use it, but also the, uh, the storing system, the University of Chicago that was responsible for experiment, used this uh, uh, notation also to archive the various pieces of equipment. And in fact, this is uh, a top secret list of the, to of the tools. You see lead, you can recognize lead, uranium, and a number of things. Uh, and uh, you see the uh, RU, power supply, the heffa lamp, lead counter. And for those of you that are more uh, you know, uh, this is uh, heffalamp and this is piglet. And, you know, so this is really true that uh, Fermi was using this notation and was so, um, you know, so popular that it also went, so official, I will say, that it also went to the archiving. Uh, the, the person, you know, you may wonder why this, this happened and why we start from this. Because uh, the, the reason why we start from this sort of light um, uh, story is just because this tells us probably something. We really don't know why Fermi really decided to use Winnie the Pooh. Uh, the person who wrote this this paper in physics of plasma, sorry, in uh, physics today, uh, you know, uh, ma make a speculation that, of course, uh, uh, you know, physics and people cannot can never be, in, uh, you know, detached. I mean, scientists are human beings, and therefore, uh, probably at that time, this beam, uh, these people were. Uh, I'm sorry, no, I, I have also my new. Sorry, uh, th these people were. Uh, knew that they were applying their physics to the world development. 
And therefore, uh, it may very well be the case that Fermi found his world a bit more approachable, this world of a person that was basically designing a bomb by mixing fact with a bit of fiction. So that's, you know, that's a little bit of, uh, of uh, background. And uh, all right, and th this was just to start. Uh, today it has been, I suppose, a long day for you. We are, we are at the end uh, of, the, of, of a long day, of a second of the long day. So thanks for being here. Uh, sometime, uh, you know, times never goes by. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, some of you has experienced uh, the, the very nasty situation of getting, you know, very tight shoes. It could happen in the mountains when you're hiking or if you are in a very official occasion and then, you know, uh, lady shoes or men's shoes that are very nice and polished but they really hurt. And, uh, uh, you know, and you, you never, you, you just w w looking, watching your, the time and see, hoping that it goes by as soon as possible, but it never really, uh, it rarely really goes by. Uh, about, uh, you know, 80 years ago, they had the same problem, of course, uh, and the shoes is a pretty old tool for men. And uh, they, uh, they found a solution for this, which is this, this instrument here. It's a cabinet, you see there is an opening down here and two periscopes up here. And uh, this cabinet actually was a fluoroscope and was meant to uh, check that your shoes that you were going to buy in a shop were perfectly fitting your, uh, your feet. Uh, and in fact, they were also releasing a certificate for this. Uh, you see, the, the, the situation was like that. Basically, you were supposed to put your feet down here and the, the shopkeeper and maybe a friend had a chance, or yourself, of course, had a chance to see through one of these, uh, or both of these periscopes. And of course, they, they switch on uh, an X-ray source, uh, and there was a screen, and so they were able to take a live picture of your, of your feet and also within the shoe. So the, 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 the shopkeeper was able really to fit the shoes at your desire and to avoid this uh, uh, very painful situation of very tight shoes. Of course, they also measure your weight. It was pretty scientific things. Uh, the, the, and this was considered a big gadget. You know, probably you, you still know Dr. Schultz, it's still on the market. Uh, and they were advertising that uh, show fitting expert from the Chicago factory. They were coming with this, with this tool. Uh, the small problem, of course, is that they uh, later realized that they were using a 50 kV X-ray tube with uh, about uh, 5 milliamps. And uh, uh, the dose on the feet for each single try was about uh, uh, 0.1 sievert, which is about 100 X-ray radiographies. And this for the person, just think of the poor guy that was working the shop. Uh, by 1970, it took up to 1970 that 33 US states have banned that machine. And it seems that in the late 70s, so, you know, I think not really many years ago, uh, the last recorded site of, uh, of, this, of this machine was, was uh, done in, uh, was recorded in, uh, in, in Boston. Uh, today, actually, the fluoroscope, uh, it's, a, uh, it, it, it's a common tool in medicine. I mean, basically every ER room or every surgical uh, um, room has, has one of that because it's very useful, for example, for, for orthopedic surgeon to, to check what they're doing uh, while they work on your bones, for example. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, this is much more controlled these days still. It's the same principle. But uh, uh, just to say that, uh, you know, uh, atom, uh, which is a word that normally has, has really many meanings and uh, some, most of them are not so, are not so nice. Uh, and since years and since decades, uh, a number of really unusual and strange application. Either the atom itself or its component like the nucleus or the electrons that or you know, the byproduct of atoms like uh, electromagnetic radiation as we saw before. So, uh, of course, also our science, the, the, you know, the science we study, well, I mean, most of us study because I understand that there are also students from, from the IST that don't do, they're not in, they are in physics, but not in fusion. So, but the science that most of, do, uh, most of us uh, do, uh, which is fusion, of course, has to do with atoms. Uh, and uh, I, I made an exercise. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, there is this very fancy uh, um, website, world.net, that provides you uh, a cloud awards, you give, you input a text and it gives you a cloud and the largest the, the word it means that it's repeated more time. And this, the, this is the uh, ITER website science page, that is what is fusion. And you do the exercise and you see it's not really, you know, there are other things, it's, it's sort of interesting by itself. 
you could, you know, be, because you could understand what we really like to communicate uh, to, to the public. But anyway, there are atoms also down here, not really as big as fusion or as, as reaction, but anyway, we don't forget that, you know, our science is made of atoms or uh, mostly of, of that their components, which are nucleus, nuclei and electrons. So this was a sort of long, long introduction, but uh, just to, to tell you which, which is the goal of today. Uh, the goal of today is uh, to do uh, together uh, a journey uh, through the last 100 years and, uh, and hopefully trying to see the most known but also the less known story or anecdotes about atoms. Obviously, this subject could be well, for, could be well suited for an entire class, for an entire course. So I really don't pretend to be exhaustive. I will definitely forget a number of things. This is my, my personal choice. So take us for what, for what it is. Certainly all of you will have much more stories and, uh, to add, and maybe we can discuss it a bit later. Uh, all goes back to the 1913, July 1913, and uh, uh, Niels Bohr uh, from Copenhagen uh, published on the Philosophical Magazine. Uh, at the time, Physics was published on the Philosophical Magazine. Uh, the first of three papers in which he was, he was uh, presenting uh, his theory of the atom. Uh, it's very interesting because this come after about uh, 22 or three decades, I would say, where really there was a very uh, sort of a crash, uh, a crash, I'd say, task to understand the microscopic structure of the nature, uh, which was sort of unrevealed for uh, millennia, you know, you, you may know that uh, uh, about uh, five centuries before uh, B BC, there was uh, the, the, you know, the atomists by, by the by Greek philosopher, they started to, uh, to think about uh, the role uh, of the atom, uh, of course, on a philosophical side, but, you know, it was pretty interesting to see how much they could anticipate. Then, you know, basically you had to, to wait a long time, almost, well, more than a millennium, up until to the Middle Age, uh, when the alchemists started to, you know, to, to go back to this story, and there are a lot of good reasons why did it, this didn't happen before. Uh, then uh, chemistry, Dalton, uh, the, the, the French Revolution, and then uh, Lavoisier, Dalton, and the, 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 the work of chemistry that sort of start is marked as the start of modern atomic theory. And then 1869, the uh, Mendeleev. Uh, um, um, design the periodic table, which is, by the way, a story in itself. I really uh, suggest you reading. I see that time is really going fast, so it's, uh, I cannot stop in that. But uh, the intellectual challenge that uh, of, um, of Mendeleev that uh, uh, did not have measurements of the charge uh, of the ions, but only of the masses. So he was able to compile this table, and he was able to leave gaps where it was uh, not able to provide measurement, but where it was supposing that some new elements were. And it's really amazing how, you know, how creative and which kind of vision this person had in leaving these gaps. But it's, it's a story in itself. Again, you can Google. Uh, there are a lot of um, stories on, on books about that. Uh, so basically, the, the, the atom remained lonely for really a lot of time. I mean, it's from, you know, from 500 before BC to more or less, you know, a century ago, two centuries ago. Uh, there is a quotation, uh, George uh, Wald, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's a physiologist, he, is, uh, he, he won the Nobel Prize for the medicine. Uh, and uh, this, the same quotation is also attributed to Bohr. I, I haven't been really uh, able to find out uh, which is the right one, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. I mean, what is interesting is that uh, it would be a poor thing to be an atom in an universe without physicists. Or if you, if you want a physicist, it's an atom's way of knowing about atoms. So really, atoms was waiting for physicists. And uh, he had to wait along. But then uh, when the physicists realized that uh, there was something interesting down there, uh, the story uh, went really very quick. And uh, it's really amazing in, time, in terms of uh, science development how quick it was uh, from you know, around about 1870 to 1940, roughly speaking. Uh, you know, it's more or less uh, less than a century, I should say. And you have this sequence that starts, of course, it's not really related to atoms, but uh, you know, it's, it marks an era, like the Maxwell equation. But then periodic table, X-ray, radioactivity, photoelectric effect, black body, atomic spectra, the discovery of the electron, the nucleus. Uh, and then, of course, the 1913, which is sort of our landmark for today, which, are, which is the Bohr model, and immediately after the matter waves, the Schrodinger equation, the, the quantum mechanics, 
the neutron discovery, the fission, and so on and so forth. So it's really, you know, we had to wait for a long time, but then it was really worthwhile waiting because uh, in, in so, I mean, in these years, a lot of things happening. It's really, you know, when you read, go, you, you go back to this year, it's really amazing how, how life should have been for our colleagues at that time, you know. They probably knew almost everyone in the field and they were exchanging letters and uh, of course no mails, no kind of things, but, uh, or, or, or um, contribution to, to meetings and things like that and uh, where they were really almost month by month uh, founding uh, new things. And one thing that I really want to you, uh, to, to it, it's obvious for us that we are physicists, but uh, uh, for, if, you, if you see it in perspective, uh, remember that you know the atoms is very tiny. I mean, and there was till now, and this is a re very recent picture by IBM. Uh, till now, you, that's probably the best approximation of individual atoms, uh, real uh, real pictures that you can get. So it's pretty you know far away from what you, we imagine from the planetary model. But at that time, really, they had no idea, or, or I mean, no, no possibility of, uh, of exploring individual atoms, of seeing. So all what they were concluding was from by indirect evidences. And it's, you know, the example we, we, I mean, I usually like to do is like the wind. You know, you never see the wind. You, you can study it by its effect on a sail or on a flag or whatever, I mean. But, and the same was for them. And despite this fact, and despite a very simple for our standard analysis tools, they were really able to uh, produce a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, what is still considered the modern uh, theory uh, of the atom. Uh, around the turn of the century, Thomson, J.J. Thomson, uh, discovered the electron. He was studying X-ray that at that time were very popular because Rentgen just discovered them. He had an X-ray tube uh, and uh, he discovered the electrons, uh, seeing the deflection uh, of the of the beam, and therefore uh, he prompted, uh, you know, he, he provided a model. He knew that the atom uh, had to be neutral, and uh, it's the so-called plum padding, plum padding model. You know, he, had, he thought that the atom is like uh, a padding with the raisings, and the, the charge, the positive charge is distributed, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the core of the atom, in, in the, all the atoms, sorry, and the electric charge is within uh, the, um, is, with, is embedded within uh, um, the negative, the positive charge. So electrons are embedded within the positive charge. So the conclusion of Thomson is that the atom basically is, is uh, or the positive charge is as big as the atom itself. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, all of us had probably arguments with our fathers. Sometimes these arguments uh, could, could, could lead uh, a long way because you, this is Thomson. And this is his son, uh, George Thomson. And uh, you know, Thomson got the Nobel Prize for discovering the electron. And his son, that electron was a particle. And his son, uh, about 30 years later, got the Nobel Prize to discover that the electron is a wave. So uh, it's, uh, it's one of the interesting coincidences of story uh, of history that uh, that you know uh, that happens. Uh, as I said, uh, just a few years later, uh, Radford. Uh, together with Geiger and Marsden, made uh, a seminal experiment. They were uh, using a radioactive source. Radioactivity at that time, of course, became a very powerful tool to, 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 get, uh, uh, to get particles for, you know, for, um, for studies. Uh, they were irradiating a gold foil. Uh, they were basically expecting that, you know, uh, based on the uh, Thomson model of the atom, that the beam would have been almost undeflected. And as you know, by you know, from your uh, first year or second year classes, they instead uh, observed that there were deflection even at 90 degrees, so a very large angle. Uh, and the comment that Radford said uh, was that it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened in my life. It was almost incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell, so a 15-inch shell, it's, it's a big kind of ball, uh, at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So that's, that's the level of uh, uh, unexpected things that they were uh, realizing. And thanks to this, they, they discover, of course, uh, uh, the nucleus. Uh, they discovered the nucleus. Uh, they realized that uh, actually the nucleus was only a minor, tiny part of the entire atom, as you know, you know it's 10, 10, 10 to the minus 15. 
uh, in comparison with about a 10 to the minus 10, which is the size of the atom. And uh, therefore, Radford was, the, uh, was able to put uh, on the table the, the planetary model uh, with, uh, with a core, which is a nucleus, uh, and uh, electrons, which were uh, orbitating uh, around, uh, around the, the nucleus. Uh, and here, uh, Bohr's comes. This is a picture which, uh, 1913, this is Lisbon, uh, from, uh, that's a picture of 1913, so it's, you know, it's not really ages ago, it's something that it's, well, you know, it's recorded in our memory. Probably, you know, my grandmother was born in 1913, so uh, it's a time uh, it's not really that far away. Uh, Bohr uh, really wanted uh, to address uh, some unresolved issue uh, of, the, of the Bohr's model, of, sorry, of the Rutherford model, and uh, the main one that you know very well uh, is that uh, uh, well, there were a number of them, uh, which would be too, too long to, 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 you know, to recap, but you probably remember all of them. You know, they had observation of the spectra, uh, they had observation of the uh, black body radiation, and so they had the Planck theory of the black body radiation, so things, a number of things happening at that time. Uh, but basically, uh, the, probably the number one question is that if you leave classi a classical electron orbitating uh, around uh, a nucleus, you would expect that uh, um, because it emits uh, electromagnetic radiation, and so sooner or later it collapses uh, on the atom. And this is more sooner than later. It should take a really very short time. And uh, this was unresolved. And here, uh, you know, the vision and the genius of Bohr came uh, it basically, uh, I mean, sort of expanded, extended uh, Radford theory, uh, by, which was still based on classical physics, by going beyond. It, it, it's interesting that he used four postulates, so that uh, not for all of them had a clear demonstration. They were demonstrated also later with quantum, and proved later by quantum mechanics, but, you know, many times... Uh, uh, the, the genius is just the, the person that is going to, to you know, to, to anticipate things. And uh, so he said, all right, let's assume that the electrons uh, uh, go in circular orbits and they are kept on, on the orbit by electrostatic force, which is a classical concept. But then he postulated that all, not all the infinite orbits of classical mechanics are allowed, but only that with uh, some well-defined values of the angular momentum. And uh, with that, he, uh, he introduced the uh, quantization of angular momentum, so the, the very important uh, the topics of, uh, of um, qu quantum. Uh, he also postulated that orbital electrons do not irradiate, and electromagnetic radiation is emitted only when the electrons discontinuously jump from one orbit to the other, and this frequency is uh, it's very much uh, uh, it's exactly equal to the difference in energy divided by the Planck's constant. Uh, this was, you know, uh, in agreement with, um, with previous findings, particularly you know, Einstein's photoelectric effect, 1905. Uh, so all things were you know, we're, we're going together. And, and therefore, that, that's why, you know, Bohr's vision, it's, it's so important and so, so still is the basis for the semi-classical model of, of the atom. Uh, all right, so that, that's our starting point. You know, it's, uh, I know this is already 20 minutes I'm talking, and I'm at the starting point. Well, that's not, it's not as bad, actually. Uh, uh, it's interesting that in the same time, uh, even if, of course, on an independent path, uh, mm, products of uh, the atoms, of the atomic physics, were used for practical purposes. Uh, this gentleman is uh, an Italian, it's Guglielmo Marconi, and uh, in 1902 uh, he was able uh, to uh, transmit the first radio message from Northern Atlantic to Europe, the first transatlantic message, you know. It's considered the founder of radio transmission. But the reason why uh, I'm mentioning is this is that, uh, of course, when, when you talk to radios, when you think to radios, you think in terms of antennas. And in our field, uh, we use a lot of antennas. I mean, this is the ion cyclotron, ethian current drive antenna system. I think it's the ether one, uh, the, one of the, the, of the ether one design. Uh, and uh, so antennas are broadly used in, uh, in plasmas. I mean, for, for a number, and infusion plasmas in particular. Uh, and are broadly used, of course, also in technology. I mean, oh, each of us has a telephone that has an antenna in that. Uh, but the reason why I mention this is that uh, it's another small curiosity. You may wonder where the antenna name comes. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a nautical term. It's, it comes from, it's an Italian word. And uh, uh, the antenna, it's this pool. Uh, it's the top pool in, in the sailing boats. Where the, where the sail is, is anchored to some extent. And the story is that Marconi you know, was son uh, of, uh, of a 
pretty, you know, rich person that uh, wanted for him a career in the navies. You know, he was living to, to call to the cost. He wanted to be a navy officer, but Mar Marconi preferred to be an inventor. Uh, but nonetheless, his, his dad gave to him uh, in the young age, uh, you know, a, a lot of instruction, gave him a boat, also trying to, to encourage this career that never worked. But anyway, uh, the antenna is exactly this pool, and uh, the reason why uh, Marconi called, you know, his, his antenna antenna is that because he realized that the transmission was much more effective when one of the two terminals was pretty high with respect to, to, to the ground level. So from that, the story of the word antenna. Uh, of course, you can never, you know, as, as you will see also in the following of my talk, uh, and I also opened with the, the, our, our conversation with, uh, with the story of Fermi and the Winnie the Pooh, uh, you can never, uh, you know, disentangle physics uh, uh, from, from, from society, from, from, from history, from real life. And uh, real life in that time uh, uh, was that uh, 1914, the First World War, uh, was, uh, you know, started. Uh, and this, which was, of course, a, a big event for Europe and would have been caused, you know, millions of casualties. Uh, and uh, this event also marked uh, uh, one of these things uh, for which, you know, science can, well, not science in itself, of course, but men say that you, science, cannot really be proud of. Uh, this is, a, a, you, know, a, you know, a compound, it's CO, Cl2. It seems, you know, just uh, carbon, oxygen, chlorine. That's really very strange. Unfortunately, this is false gene. And, uh, you know, the first world war uh, marked the first use of chemistry, uh, the extended use of chemistry for uh, warfare. Uh, so they used uh, um, these ga many gases, but in particular this one, uh, in shells, in bombs, uh, which made, you know, it's estimated that they made about uh, 100,000 deaths uh, uh, during the war. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, this was really, uh, uh, this was used almost by everyone. Somebody started, and then of course they all realized that it was uh, uh, a very powerful, a tremendous tool. Uh, and uh, a tool to uh, which uh, all everyone was uh, completely unprepared. You know, they started to use the first gas masks, but uh, they really didn't work. Uh, I find out that there were a direction from the from the Italian generals to the troops uh, that uh, in case of a gas attack, they were supposed if they didn't have a mask, they didn't, they were supposed to put you know uh, some bread in the mouth, possibly as wet bread in the mouth put a towel on top of that, then the bread should have acted as a filter towards the poison things. Of course, unfortunately, it didn't work that way. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, a lot of people really were killed by, by these gases, uh, which, are, which still now, you know, from time to time, you hear that there are concerns uh, about uh, uh, their use in, uh, in the war field, uh, unfortunately, still now. But if 1915 uh, uh, marked the start, the first use of chemistry or atomic physics, if you wish, for bad uses, it's also marked, uh, if you wish, the first uh, use uh, for, for good purposes. Uh, you may know the story of Marie Curie, you know, she's, she's twice Nobel Prize for chemistry and physics. She's one of the few people that get two Nobel Prize. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I don't want really to go in all uh, uh, its uh, achieve, her achievement. You, can, you, you probably know very well that uh, Marie Curie, she was Polish, she married a French person, uh, uh, was really an you know, a great scientist, but uh, an incredible person. Uh, and uh, during the war, uh, she, she, were, she was aware of her responsibility as a physicist. She was working with radioactivity. And more or less a few years earlier, uh, Röntgen discovered X-ray, so the first uses of X-ray were done. Uh, and uh, she uh, asked and founded herself with her money, the French government, to put together uh, a squad of this called the Petit Curie, which are a small, uh, you know, small car, uh, hospital, small, little hospital, which were sort of radiological uh, units. And she, she went herself with her daughter in the battlefields to use uh, radiological units uh, to, you know, to diagnose uh, the soldiers that were injured uh, in, on the battlefield and to try to, to save their lives. Uh, so it's, so I, I found myself when going through this talk very interesting. This, you know, this this uh, anniversary that marks, you know, poison gases, but at the same time, 
the use of uh, you know the first the start of using of nuclear medicine, if you want. Uh, all right, uh, you, you you know the end the war ends and uh, leaves Europe uh, in a in a very poor situation. There is not all Europe, but the whole uh, world. 1929, you know, there is a big uh, stock exchange crash. That uh, you know, it's, it became unfortunately uh, it came again popular uh, in the recent years because of big uh, stock market crashes of uh, 2008 and 2009. Uh, and uh, in those years, uh, nonetheless, physics was was proceeding. And uh, as uh, in this timeline that I showed you before, uh, you, you realize you know how much activity. Uh, one uh, one experience that is of course is familiar to me because you know I'm, I'm from Italy, but uh, probably it's pretty known to everyone. It's the the so-called the, Pan, the Panisperna Street Boys, which, which was a group of people that led by Enrico Fermi. Uh, that uh, via Panisperna, it's a street in downtown Rome, uh, so it's still there. I mean, and of course, and uh, I think it's, you can still visit the Enrico Fermi Center. And uh, in these years, so late 20s, uh, they started uh, to build up you know, this group there. And one thing that I really want to, uh, to highlight, I put the dates, the birth date of these people, because remember, this is 1929 uh, when this experience started. So these guys uh, were you know, from uh, 28 uh, to 23 years old. You know, uh, Fermi was, uh, I think, the second or the third a uh, theoretical physics professor in Italy, and uh, he was uh, 28 years old. So, you know, when, uh, you know when, when you think to your future, really never, never hesitate uh, in thinking, you know, uh, the, the best for, for your career. I mean, it's, you know, it was possible those times. I think it's still possible now. And these guys uh, were, uh, you know, th there was a lot of enthusiasm in the, uh, in, the old, in the old Europe, but not, not only. For example, one problem that... For, um, now it's obvious for us, but it was far from being obvious for those guys, was that they realized that they had an inconsistency because now they, they had the Bohr model, but they realized that the uh, Z, so the charge number of each uh, element, was exactly one half of the mass number. And the reason is that they didn't know neutrons, of course. Neutrons were, as you see, have been discovered in 1932. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's interesting that the explanation they gave and Rutherford again uh, did it. Uh, he basically postulated uh, the so-called nuclear electrons. So he said that uh, inside the nucleus, you had protons, but also these, uh, uh, a number of free protons, let's say, uh, as large as the Z number of the element, plus a number, the equal number of, another equal number of protons with electrons, so-called uh, um, electrons, uh, uh, nuclear electrons orbitating uh, inside, uh, around them. In this way, they were able to uh, solve the, this inconsistency, so they, they, they add mass without adding any charge. Uh, so the model, in principle, could have worked, uh, which was the, the issue with that. And this is, again, one interesting thing of you know, how things are proceeding. Uh, exactly in that time, Heisenberg and you know, the physicists were working on quantum mechanics, and uh, the, the Heisenberg principle was well known, and so they immediately concluded if, they, if you wanted to confine uh, an electron uh, in such a small uh, space, uh, due to this relationship, the electron should have had a kinetic energy as large as 10, between 10 and 100 MeV. And this energy was by far larger than the binning energy of nucleons. So uh, it's interesting that they, they, before discovering the neutron by experiment, <laughs> they already realized that something was not consistent with, it, with that explanation. And indeed, it was just a few years later that uh, both and Baker uh, made an experiment that was later interpreted by the Curie, the, the daughter of Madame Curie and his, his husband, uh, Pierre Joliot. And basically, they were bombarding with alpha particles of beryllium uh, target, and they saw this strange radiation that uh, uh, that was then hitting a paraffin wax um, slab, and was producing protons that were detected. Uh, originally, they thought that this uh, uh, radiation was uh, um, was um, gamma rays that were known at that time, but then the the Curie uh, uh, that uh, she was working on that 
she demonstrated that this was not possible. Uh, this, she was not compatible with the, with, an, with, an, with the kinematics uh, of the process. And so therefore, uh, uh, just a year later, 1932, uh, Chadwick uh, postulated and, and measured the, the existence of protons. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we are in the 30s, and uh, the 30s uh, are, uh, you know, are also marked uh, by, uh, you know, by the start of, of the big dictatorships in Europe. Uh, 1934, uh, this is the first uh, meeting between Mussolini and Hitler that took place in Venice, incidentally, uh, which, is, which is my city. And uh, as you will see in the next uh, few minutes, uh, these, you know, the, the big dictatorship uh, really condition at the huge influence. There was a huge intersection between the evolution of, of physics in, that, in those years uh, and, and history. Uh, very quickly, uh, in 1934, um, the Joliot Curie uh, discovered the artificial radioactivity by bombarding elements with alpha particles. They were, you know, they were using accelerator. Uh, Fermi was, uh, was leading this little team in, uh, in Via Panisperna, and uh, you know, they didn't have a lot of resources, so they, he said, all right, I, I don't have, basically, an accelerator was really expensive for that time, as it is now. He had no funds to, to, to build an accelerator, so he sort of used his creativity, and he said, well, if instead of using uh, accelerators, I can use uh, neutrons, then maybe I can do a better, a better job. And in fact, uh, he used neutrons, he discovered uh, artificial radioactivity, and he thought that uh, they were discovered transuranic elements. That's interesting, because this was wrong. He had also to correct his Nobel lecture, because indeed they were discovering fission, but they didn't realize it. Uh, the other things that Fermi discovered is that uh, uh, the, discovered the slow neutron. He discovered that by slowing down the, slowing down the neutrons, by, um, uh, by paraffin or by water, by a moderator, uh, he was able to increase dramatically uh, the activation of, of the materials of uranium, for example. Uh, and uh, this, of course, is the basis for, for the modern, uh, for the modern um, fission reactor. And it's also interesting that, uh, uh, you know, Fermi and his group, they were really convinced that they were sort of uh, seeing something, you know, with higher number than higher Z number or mass number than uh, um, this transuranic element. They gave names to them too. Uh, and I really uh, address you to the Nobel lecture of Fermi because uh, by the time, you know, he was given the, the, the Nobel Prize for his research on these transuranic elements and for the slow neutrons. The transuranic elements, he realized, because more or less in the same years, Ann and Strassmann and Meidner dis discovered fission, he realized that uh, his explanation was wrong, and he edited his Nobel lecture. It's a footnote in the Nobel lecture that he added later, you know, very honestly saying, you know, this, this has been already passed. Uh, and uh, Ida Nodak, which is uh, an Austrian, if I remember well, uh, chemistry, uh, chemics, um, sort of... Uh, hypothesized that uh, there was, it was possible to have fission, but she had no mean to, to, to check this. And you had to wait really a few years later, uh, well, not really a few, really one or two years later, when, uh, when these three person, uh, Otto Hahn, Fritz Strassmann, and Lisa Meitner, uh, discovered and uh, made the theory of fission. Uh, it's interesting, I like, you know, all these people have a interesting story about that. You know, the way, uh, um, you know, they were working in Berlin. Uh, Meiner, she was Jewish, so in 1938, she had to, to go to Sweden uh, to, because, to escape the racial uh, laws. Uh, she was an, another incredible person, uh, the second woman to obtain a PhD at the University of Vienna, the first woman to hold a full professorship in physics in Germany. And it's very interesting, you know, at that time, no, no matter about uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the politics, but to have a woman who was, thank you, who was uh, um, a professor was in physics in particular was really considered, you know, unbelievable. Uh, and uh, the newspaper at that time, she gave uh, her Habitur lecture, which was, of course, a big event. He went to the press and, uh, 
you know, they said it has been a misprint, but clearly not. She, her uh, abitur was about the significance of radioactivity for cosmic processes, and the journalists were, wrote for cosmetic processes. Now, that of course uh, it was a sort of way to, 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 to make jokes about, about this lady. Uh, that she was the theorist, of course, of the, um, of the fission. The experiments were done by Anne Strassmann uh, in, uh, in Berlin, and uh, Meitner Frisch uh, wrote the Nature paper where they, they explained uh, fission, and they realized that when you were bombarding with a neutron, a heavy element like uranium, this got unstable, started to vibrate, and then you know, you, you know the drop model of the nucleus. At the same point, uh, the vibration is large enough that to, to split it in two parts and to produce um, uh, other neutrons. Uh, you know. It's already, I got a sign that uh, I have to be quick. Uh, then I move a little bit on, uh, even because you know, I'm pretty sure that you all are familiar with the fission physics. Uh, one thing that, again, you know, you, you know, this talk today is mostly about people uh, more than physics. Uh, this uh, three person, uh, Fritz, you know, Fritz Strassmann in particular, uh, uh, was, uh, was another very interesting person. He resigned in 1933 from the Society of German Chemists when he became part of a Nazi-controlled public corporation. And uh, during the war, he and his wife, with a, and they had a three-year son, they concealed a Jewish friend in their apartment for months. Of course, this, you know, this was really at the risk of their lives. And because of this and this you know, social commitment, Strassmann was recognized uh, uh, as the one of the rights among the nation. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's this big list of people that uh, is kept in Jerusalem and, and uh, you know, helped uh, or combat in different way uh, the Holocaust during the, the Second World War. Uh, we are, you know, these years marked a lot of things. Uh, Enrico Fermi got the Nobel Prize. One thing that always strikes me is that this person is 37 years old in this period. I can never, you know, I can never understand him. <laughs> but anyway, he's 37 years old. He's already got a Nobel Prize. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention on one thing that, uh, you know, um, um, you, you, you may notice his dress. You say, well, what's strange in his dress? He's dressed with uh, the smoking and the frack, you know, the, what, what you are expected to, to wear in front of the King of Sweden for, uh, for the Nobel Prize. Uh, you should have one just in case. Uh, for women it's different, but you know, for men, be prepared. Uh, the point is that uh, he was supposed to wear the uniform. You know, he was uh, being a professor in Italy at that time, he was supposed to be high in the hierarchy of fascism. So he was to, uh, supposed to wear the uniform and to uh, greet the king with a Roman salute that was the, the, the fascist one. Of course, it, it didn't do none of them of both. Uh, and this, this thing was, of course, noted in Italy at that time. And uh, I'm immediately after the, uh, receiving the Nobel Prize, uh, he, he boarded a, a ship to go from, uh, from Sweden to go to the United States because his wife was Jewish. So she also, he also had uh, to leave. Uh, and then we go. You know, uh, we go quickly uh, towards this uh, the, the sort of the, the black time uh, of atomic physics. Uh, uh, 1939, uh, Albert Einstein write a letter to Roosevelt, and uh, he sort of warned Roosevelt about uh, the result of Fermi and Szilard about fission, and he said, "Be careful. We achieved this, but it's possibly that also uh, our enemies are doing the same, and this could bring uh, you know a lot of power." Uh, in a bomb, so we should start the project, and this more or less starts the, you know, the, the initiative uh, of the uh, of the atomic uh, effort in the United States for for uh, weapon use. Uh, and it's interesting that in these years, uh, even well before the bomb, the power of the atom was sort of felt by the public opinion, down to the point that this is uh, this is a cartoon, you know, Mickey Mouse. Uh, that uh, in 1937, uh, this, uh, the friend of Mickey Mouse, which is a professor, a physicist, that sort of reminds Einstein, I mean, it's, it's, a, long, it's a long story, but just to make a long story short, uh, the, the bad guy uh, sort of steal uh, the recipe for an, a new formula that could produce a huge amount of energy, and Mickey Mouse uh, is able to bring it back to Professor Enigma here. Uh, and then uh, um, Mickey, Mou uh, Mickey Mouse tells the professor, why don't you make it public, you know, so people can use it. And in 1937 he said, uh, no, my friend, 
I think it's better if you should keep it by myself because it could be really very dangerous. Uh, I have the same uh, strip in Italian because there is an interesting story for, for comics lover. Here in the American version, they don't talk about atomic. It's, you understand that it's dead, but they don't use the word atomic bomb. Uh, it's used in 1937 or 38 by the Italian translator. So in Italian, you see it's written atomy here, which is, uh, you know, they, they ex make it explicit. And uh, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, this, this is comics. Kids were reading it uh, at that time. And then, uh, you know, all the effort that led to 1942, to Fermi, uh, to, you know, to, to the first chain reaction that happened in Chicago. If, you, if it happens you are in Chicago for business or for pleasure, just visit the uh, University of Chicago campus, which is a very nice area. There is this Henry Moore monument and uh, the plaque that remember the location where, uh, where the, you know, the, the, the fission reaction was, the chain reaction was studied. Uh, you know how it works, so I really can, can be quick on that. Uh, again, I like to, to tell, you know, the, all these talk is about stories mostly. Uh, this, is, this is very sort of nice. Uh, you know, neutrons, they knew neutrons were uh, sort of uh, blocked by air, so they really wanted to, to avoid this, so they wanted to evacuate the pile as much as possible, but the pile was, was a big thing. So, and they said, how do we evacuate it? We make a vacuum container. How we make a vacuum container? They said, okay, let's make a big plastic bag. So who was producing plastic bags? Goodyear at the time, they were producing lighter than air aircraft, you know, this, this, this kind of stuff here. And so they, they, you know, these physicists went to the, to the, to the Goodyear and they said that we need you know, a really big, some like 10 meters by 10 meters balloon with a cubic size. Uh, and uh, of course they were not allowed to tell the reason and the good and they just said oh you know we, we need the the, 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 the the air force needed for for some experiments and so it's it's, it's reported that uh, you know this triggered a lot of jokes among the Goodyear engineers because they said well I mean, these this soldiers did never understand how this works. Right? can you make it floating or you know going uh, a, a cube and instead uh, it was used to, to you know the, the, the purpose was completely different uh, and so for 1942, uh, Compton, the Dean of Physics Department, called the, the you know, National Defense Research Committee, uh, saying that the Italian navigator was landing a new world. How were the natives? Very friendly. And that's another of the things that was noted at that time. This happened in 1942. And uh, this was coded, of course. This was a phone call, and it was intended to be uh, coded. And uh, it was not pre-designed, the code. And Compton said that he was inspired by, you know, by the fact that 1492, exactly with the same figures, another Italian person discovered a new world. And for them, of course, this was a sort of, a, uh, a sort of new discovery. All right. Uh, after the, the, the experiment was done, 1942, Wigner, you may be familiar with the Wigner lattice. So I'm sure you have studied it. Wigner was participating in this experiment. He brought a bottle of Chianti, you know, in honor of Fermi. It was in Italian. They drank it and they, you know, so they signed the bottle. The, you know, the, the witnesses said that it was a rather unhappy celebration. And probably the reason was that, you know, again, we go back to the Winnie the Pooh story at the beginning. They were all knew what would have happened. And in fact, what has happened a few years later was the atomic bomb that uh, was launched uh, on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. And uh, these kind of things, of course, uh, you know, uh, marked uh, the, 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 you know, a new era for the word atom. The word atom, since then, lost its uh, meaning, uh, which was restricted to a small community. It became a worldwide word with the meaning of, you know, of the atomic mushroom, unfortunately. And it was so much, uh, you know, uh, permeating the culture, the, the life of the people, that even, you know, uh, uh, Pablo Neruda, you know, this child in... Uh, writer, wrote the Nobel Prize for Literature, uh, composed uh, uh, you know, a, a, a poetry, it's pretty famous, uh, in, uh, to, on the atom, you know, uh, sort of uh, in being astonished or really uh, terrified by the power of this tiny particle that uh, uh, has been uh, taken from his refuge in the second mantle of stone by the man, you know, and has been used in such a strange way. You have seen yesterday, uh, you know, the Dr. Strangelove, and at the same time, you had comics, uh, yeah, you have uh, even these uh, musics that were all inspired to the atom. It was really sort of permeating uh, culture in those, in those decades. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, as uh, the Second World War, also uh, the 1945, 
you know, there is the bomb, but also started mark the start of the use of uh, the atomic physics for peaceful uses. Uh, the, in 51, the first experimental breeder reactor uh, was able to illuminate four light bulbs, first time that nuclear electricity was uh, produced by nuclear energy. And only a few years later, in 1954, in the, United, in the Soviet Union, uh, the Atom Mirny, the peaceful atom, uh, power plant was open and was the first nuclear power plant that gener generated electricity for commercial use. I think if you remember well, something like of the order of five megawatts, so it was really very tiny. Uh, and also this year marked, uh, the, the, you know, despite it was in the Cold War, marked uh, the um, sort of uh, um, uh, effort of the scientist community to get together and to share information as much as it, could, it was allowed by, uh, by physics. Sorry, by the politician. 1955, the first conference in Geneva called the Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy that gathers together under the auspices of the United Nations uh, physicists from all over the world and from the, from the two big blocks, the, the Western and Eastern blocks. In 1958, the second conference dedicated to fusion. You may have been aware of this. Uh, uh, and, you know, there is very in interesting quotation by Edward Teller that uh, really sort of captured the atmosphere of those times of that conference, uh, when uh, a large and important area of research, we can now all talk and work together freely. You know, and it's true that our field since then has always been really very open, of course, you know, in the 60s it probably was not as open as it is now, but certainly the 1958 conference uh, was really marked uh, is for us, uh, fusion physicists, the mark of the start of the peaceful uses of fusion. Uh, of course, also, as we, 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 you, know, you, you, may, you may know a lot of stories about fusion, in 1958, uh, we thought we have done it. it seems that, you know, it's uh, something, that's probably the origin of why they, they blame us, because we always say it's 20 years uh, close. But in 1958, uh, uh, the, Z, the Z experiment uh, in, uh, in, Ka, in, I think it was in Arwell, uh, you know, was successful, and uh, again, it's a long story, but it's interesting, and it really tells you how dangerous could be the interaction between uh, the scientists and the journalists if you basically, you, if you are not clear enough. The story is that these poor physicists really didn't understand what was happening, and the journalist was sort of pushing, really, tell us what is, are you reached thermonuclear fusion? And so they said, well, yeah, well, perhaps, yes, no. So at the end, this is what came out in the press. Of course, it was, uh, it was a big fiasco eventually because, of course, they got a great scientific result, but it was far from being fusion. And still, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a touch to, to, to our history. Uh, you know, I, I like Mickey Mouse, you can tell. That's the Italian version. I don't think it's, uh, uh, it's in, the, in, the, in the US, in the, in the English version. But anyway, the tokamak went also, also the tokamak went to Mickey Mouse, you know, with, uh, and it's uh, something that produced energy, clean, inexhaustible, and uh, free, basically free. You know, it's, so that's, this is 1970-something. It's probably coincided with the, with the start of jet design, so it's very interesting that it's more or less the same times. Uh, and uh, one thing that I discovered by chance, this is not done by purpose, I'm pretty sure that the ratio didn't do, didn't do it by purpose, but exactly uh, uh, 29 years ago, on December 19, uh, sorry, November 19, in Geneva, one of these big summit between, between the former Soviet Union and the United States started. Uh, at that time, high in the agenda was the dismantling nuclear weapons, of course, and ending the Cold War. Just a few years later, the Berlin Wall would have fallen. Uh, and Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Reagan, uh, as a result of this meeting, one of the results of this meeting, that you can still read in the, this is the, the Reagan Library, it's, it's online, the document, uh, is the start of a development of an international cooperation in obtaining fusion. And uh, this means ITER. ITER was designing, was decided in uh, December 19, sorry, November 19, 1985. You may wonder why it took 30 years and we are still there building it, but you know, that's a different story that I'm, probably you heard it this morning by, by Roger. So ITER is here. And now let's go to, to today and we, we, are, we are going to close. Uh, that's, that's another movie that uh, should start. What, 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 what's physics today? What, what's the atom today? Even uh, after so many years, uh, the atom is still, uh, you know, attracting interest. 
this is, uh, yeah, it's, it's the press conference that happened about a couple of years ago, uh, when at CERN uh, it was presented, uh, uh, the, the result, uh, the, the experimental uh, result about the Higgs boson. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you are all aware of uh, how much interest the science of the atoms, of what is inside the atom, still capture uh, into the community. So it's something on which, uh, uh, you know, there is still a lot, luckily enough, a lot of interest. And uh, atoms, it's, uh, you know, it's used for many things. Uh, and so this is one also of the things that we should bring home, because I'm pretty sure that each of us, each of you has been asked uh, by friends on uh, about how bad uh, the, the, the word uh, or the adjective atomic or nuclear is. And, you know, all of us face the fact that, you know, fusion is, is considered nuclear. Nuclear, it's in the public opinion, it's often bad. But, uh, uh, you know, nuclear is also uh, part of a program, which is Atoms for Food, which is a partnership because between the IAEA, you may be familiar with IAEA because IAEA, you know, we write papers for the IAEA conference. The last one was a couple of months ago. But the, the FAO has a joint program with IAEA to use uh, atoms for the agriculture and the environment, uh, for, crop, for improving the crop production, for the pest control, for the animal health, uh, for the environmental protection, for food safety. Uh, you know, for example, one very interesting application of, uh, of nuclear techniques and uh, gamma ray in particular is to, is the, uh, to make the um, so-called uh, sterile insect. You know, there are some kind of insects like the screw worm or the tsetse fly that are really uh, causing huge damages to agriculture, in particular in the poorer countries. If you irradiate males, uh, a lot of males with, uh, and you made it sterile, and you relieve it, in the, you release it in the um, in the air. This male, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, try to, to, to I mean, they not try. They, they have uh, uh, intercourses with females, but the, from these intercourses, no, uh, you know, no eggs are produced. So, in this way, if you are, if you insist enough, uh, you are, you are able to completely or almost completely uh, eliminate uh, big population of insects. And interesting that they free the irradiate males because normally are the females that are more dangerous uh, for, uh, for the animals. Uh, of course, you use uh, radiation for genetically modified um, food. Uh, you use uh, irradiation, uh, you use also radioactive tracer, of course, and you know, the, the black, uh, black uh, sheep here. In medicine, agriculture, civil engineering, you, 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 you can't believe how many uses you do have of radioactive tracers. For example, they use it also to um, optimize the fertilizer. You know, fertilizer are good to some extent, but also bad because they release a lot of chemicals in the field. You want to optimize their use and to use as less as possible of them. Uh, and uh, by adding a little bit, I think they use tritium, just, you know, tritium tracer, they're able to see uh, which part of the plant absorb fertilizer, they discovered that for some plants, more than the root are the, uh, the leaves that absorb better the fertilizers, and therefore they try to, uh, to improve this. Nuclear medicine, you know, both for imaging and diagnosis and treatment. I see I'm 57 minutes, I, can I have five more minutes? Uh, okay, and I'm going to finish. Uh, CAT, scintigraphy, and then you can use it for treatment. You're all aware of that. And uh, uh, that's maybe you. You recognize this. And, uh, uh, that's another. Uh, okay, let's go down. It's another interesting story about about the Beatles uh, because uh, uh, now that the Beatles were recording their um, their songs for EMI, EMI is it, uh, at the recording branch, a music branch was was a big electronic company in this in the 50s, 60s in the United Kingdom, and they were also developing uh, CAT scanners. And in particular, Hans Field, he was an engineer working for them, and he was leading um, the CAT uh, CAT uh, scanner group that uh, led in the 70s to produce the first CAT scanner for the brain that was then uh, used for the entire body. Hans Field, uh, together with uh, Cormac, got the Nobel Prize in 1979 for this, uh, for this invention. 
And there is this legend that uh, part of the effort uh, has been paid uh, by the royalties of the Beatles songs, you know, because e EMI was making a huge amount of money, in the, uh, money in these years because of, of the Beatles, and so they were more prone on founding uh, research. Uh, indeed, uh, this is it's a nice story. If I can stop it, uh, let's see. It's a nice story. It's nice to just to, to listen a little bit of Beatles at this time in the evening. It's probably good, but it's not completely true, I should say. And in fact, there is also a paper that's you know it's a, it's a paper uh, which is published in you know it's in Journal of Computer Assisted Tomography that's entitled "Do We Really Need to Thank the Beatles for the Financing or Development of the Computer Tomography Scanner?" And the answer is not exactly true because uh, e EMI put about under thousand pound and the uh, UK Health Service put about 600,000 pounds. So basically the, 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 the claim of the author of the paper is that we should uh, uh, thanks better uh, British taxpayers and official British DHSS are to be thanks for the city scanner more the born at the Beatles. But anyway, no, that's, that's a nice story to, uh, to say. All right, going to finish. Uh, and uh, I, I go to, to really to, to the most modern things and uh, going back to, to the Buddha. What, why, why Buddha? You know that in the, uh, in the Buddhism, the Buddha very often sits on a lotus flower. And the reason for this is that the lotus is considered uh, uh, you know, uh, a symbol of purity. And the reason is that uh, its leaves and its flowers are always clean, even if it, uh, it leaves in max, you know, in, in, you know, in small pounds uh, where, where the water is not clean. And the reason for that is the particular structure uh, of the lotus leaves, uh, which uh, sort of uh, has a self-cleaning properties that are a result of uh, very high water repellence uh, by the leaves of the lotus flower. Basically, what happens is that the dirt particles are picked up by the water droplets due to this nano-architecture of the, of the surface. The surface of the uh, leaves of the lotus is made, is made by all these tiny uh, wax needles. And uh, on these wax needles, the adhesion force of water is reduced to a very minimum, so therefore the water droplets can really go down uh, the leaves and bring with them all the dirt. And that's why uh, they, 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 keep, they keep clean. Uh, it's interesting that uh, this is at the base, as you know, a lot of nanotechnology efforts. Uh, my jacket, which is there, that one, uh, and most of your jackets are treated in this way to, to increase the hydrophobia and so to, to make it more hydro repellent. Uh, there are architects that also think uh, somebody came out with a project to make uh, all the skyscrapers in New York with these uh, windows that are sort of uh, based on these properties with special glasses that make it self cleanings. All right, the future, and uh, I'm over. Uh, the future is the, my last two slides. Of course, the future for us. Uh, could be demo, hopefully it will be demo. I mean, I hope that uh, most of you will see it, a demo uh, attached to the electricity net uh, uh, in, their, in their lifetime. Uh, it's, it's a big challenge uh, for, for fusion. ITER is already a big challenge, but if we go back to all what has been done on atomic physics over the years, and in particular in the last decades, we can really be confident that if the community really wish, and if your enthusiasm really uh, wants, uh, we can do this, you, and you can do this, you know, you are the generation that will see uh, fusion as an electricity source. So I think if we are inspired by, by the last century, we can really hope for, for a better decade. And of course, I, I leave you also with, uh, with, with the message that uh, fusion is not the only application. You know, it's, uh, this is not a joke. It, uh, you know, it's, it's a joke in the movie, of course, in Star Trek. You may remember that they had this uh, sort of transporter that was able to transport uh, people from, from one side to the other. Uh, and, uh, but you know that uh, our colleagues uh, are working on quantum, uh, quantum transport. Uh, and entanglement, and therefore this could be another area where uh, in the future atomic physics could be applied. All right, thanks for your patience, and it has been a bit long, but uh, you know, I thought, uh, I hope you, you enjoyed it, and uh, thanks again. And now, of course, you know, if there is a little bit of time, it's, uh, I'm happy to take all the questions I like. Thank you.